That's the reading. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ed, for such a long reading. Brilliant, well done. And at least you can relax now through the sermon. That is good news. Brilliant. So we're on page 1077 in our Bibles. We've been looking at John's Gospel uh, in various blocks in order. We come to this block now, starting at chapter 11, heading up to Easter. And very appropriate too, isn't it? As we think about Lazarus being raised, we'll think about Jesus being raised as we get to Easter. Let's pray now as we begin. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus is light in a dark world. Please shine that light into our hearts now as we look at your word, the Bible. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, his name was Peter, and he was a man at our church in London. He was 66, and he was a big guy. He was huge. Um, He was an ex-police officer and he was full of life and we really started getting to know Peter when we bumped into him on the underground in London. Uh, He had a hockey stick in his hand and a huge kit bag and I remember thinking wow this guy is impressive isn't he? 66, he's playing this game, good for him. Um, And then uh, the vicar, my boss, left and I had to lead the church for a year and in that time Peter was diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus and he was very ill but he was a believer in Jesus and I remember he even came on our church weekend away uh, but he never left his room Uh, in fact the ambulance had to come that first night and take him into hospital with some complications and Peter died leaving a wife in her 50s and three children in their 20s and his constant prayer was for the faith of his family. Peter died on a Saturday night and I was preaching the next morning, Sunday morning. What do you say? What do you say when that happens? Who is God when that kind of thing happens? That is what we wonder, isn't it? When we face hard stuff, it was the question we looked at actually in Exodus very recently. Who is the Lord? That's the big question in Exodus. And actually, that really kind of is the question in our passage today, because this passage is all about revealing God, all about showing God. That's what God's glory means, the the visible, the showingness of God. Have a look at this. So verse four, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. It's for showing God what's happening. Verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? Jesus wants us to see, to make God visible so we know who he is. It's an event all about who God is. Jesus wants to show us God's glory. Is God really loving? Does God want the best for me? If you're not yet a believer, that is a natural question to ask, isn't it? But even if you are a believer, we can find ourselves asking that question too. Do you remember recently we saw in John's Gospel the man born blind and his eyes were opened by Jesus? He became a believer after that. But uh, then what happened to him? Do you remember? He was kicked out of the synagogue. He was an outcast from society. This is John chapter 9. He had no livelihood. His parents were in conflict with him. And where was Jesus? Well, he was nowhere to be seen. And that can be our experience, can't it? Where is God in this? I feel on my own. Maybe it's through the death of a loved one or a worrying diagnosis. But also... It's in so many smaller things that we've prayed about to God and we think, well, if he was loving, he would sort this out. But he doesn't seem to. Who is God? Well, what we're going to see is that Jesus shows us who God is. And he does it in a really amazing way and a bit of a surprising way too. We're going to see Jesus loves and delays That's weird. We're going to see Jesus loves and defeats death. That's the big one. And we're going to see, thirdly, Jesus loves and 
dies. So let's have a look together. Firstly, Jesus loves and delays. That's how he shows us God. Isn't that strange? You can, you can only imagine, really, can't you, how the sisters, Mary and Martha, are feeling. Their brother is ill and they are distraught and they hurriedly send this message to Jesus because they know Jesus and Lazarus is actually Jesus's friend. Surely Jesus is going to help their brother. So, verse 3, the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he went and healed Lazarus. No, he stayed where he was two more days. I'm sorry, what? He loved them, so he stayed where he was. That's what the Bible says. They hope Jesus will come, but we're told he loved them, so he stayed where he was. Yes, he loved them, so he didn't come for two more days. How does that work? Now, be a bit careful here. Uh, I'm told the timing of this probably means Lazarus would probably have died anyway before Jesus arrived, even if he went straight away. But we've still got the question, why did Jesus wait? It is a question we ask, isn't it? Lord, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why aren't you fixing this? I keep asking you to help and you seem far away. Who is God? Does he love me? Does he want the best for me? And what we can say is that here in the Bible we see that Jesus both loves and delays. He loves and he delays. And the two are not incompatible with each other somehow. Isn't that surprising? Jesus says, In fact, in verse 4, no, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So his delay is so that the sisters and Lazarus and us reading this can know God, can know God for who he is through Jesus. In other words, can grow in faith. Jesus wants that for them and for us. He wants that for even believers, even the disciples, it seems. Verse 14 so then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I was, I'm glad I was not there. Surprising, isn't it? So that you may believe. But let us go to him. Okay. Well, how do you apply a truth like that to ourselves? How do you apply a truth like that to Peter, the man in our church who died, and his family when there is sadness and when God seems so distant, can we say the same thing? And I have to say, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we, We never really can say, can we, why God is allowing certain things to happen. And we never really can say how God is using those things to grow our faith. We just don't know. So we must be careful in kind of making sweeping statements to each other when we're having hard times and we're hurting. We just don't know. But what we can see here is that Jesus, he loves and he delays, and the two are not incompatible. His delay is not proof he doesn't love us. And that is quite a good place to start, isn't it? It's a good starting point. And to know that Jesus does want to show us God. He wants us to show us God in himself. And the big way he wants to do that is point two. Jesus loves and defeats death. Incredible. Let's have a look together. Verse 17. Oh, gone too far. Verse 17. Okay. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days four days. So now it is beyond doubt Lazarus is dead. And Jesus's delay means no one can say, oh, he just, you know, healed Lazarus or he just revived Lazarus. No, it's totally hopeless, isn't it? It's the worst situation. There is no hope. And here we meet 
the grieving sisters. And we see in these sisters, I think, some of ourselves in our grief. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I know you, Jesus. I know you. I know you fix bad things. You heal people. I believe in you, Jesus, in my sadness. Even now, you can help, I believe, but I'm not really sure how you can do that. This is, this is us, isn't it? It is faith and it is good, but Jesus wants Martha and he wants us to have more than just that. He wants, us to, sh- he wants to show us God, to show us God himself in himself, Jesus. So he pushes Martha just a little bit more. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha has hope. She has this, this genuine but sort of vague hope that the Jews had from the Old Testament that there would be resurrection on judgment day and God will raise Lazarus and he'll raise everyone else for judgment too. But Jesus wants to push this hope further. He wants her hope to be much more specific and much more real and much more joyful. And so he says to her one of the most famous verses in the Bible. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. Sorry, whoever lives and by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's 25 and 26. Jesus is saying, I am it. I'm that resurrection hope. I'm not just judgment, but I am eternal life for anyone. And not in a vague way. I am hope for anyone who believes in me. It's about me, trusting in me. Hope is all about Jesus specifically. Remember he said so far in John's Gospel, he's the bread of life. He said he's the light of life. And now he says, I am life. Do you get this? It's been really cool seeing um, in Exodus... Uh, how Moses wanted to know God's name. Do you remember that? What is your name? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Do you remember that? I define me. And the only way you can really know me is in what I do. And here is God himself, God the Son, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. You know God by knowing me, I am, and you know God by knowing what I do, which is being the resurrection and the life. In other words, my life-giving, Jesus says, my life-giving tells you everything. The most hopeless situation in this broken world, a man beyond hope, four days in the grave. I'm the answer. Know God in me. Do you believe this? Verse 27, Martha, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha seems to believe, doesn't she? And then she tries to stop Jesus opening the grave later. So we're not quite sure where she's up to in verse 40. That's Martha. And then there's Mary, her sister, who says a very similar thing to her sister. Verse 32, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus can normally help, but there's not much hope now that he can help. Not much hope Mary has for any help from Jesus. That's slightly different to Martha, isn't it? But in Martha and Mary, we see our own responses to hard things, don't we? Jesus can help fix things. I believe that. But I can't see how he can fix this thing. Or he could help, but he hasn't. And I'm not sure he will. And I just don't know what I'm supposed to believe about God. He's loving. I don't feel, I don't feel it. And Jesus, he wants the sisters and he wants us to watch and see something much more. And this is where it gets really exciting. Verse 33, the atmosphere is is intense, isn't it? There is wailing, there is crying. There's probably professional mourners who are making loads of noise. It is loud. 
And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who'd come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And they're right, Jesus did love Lazarus. We know that. But there is a little more, actually, to why he wept. We're told he was deeply moved in spirit. It is actually the whole hopelessness of the situation that is grieving Jesus. He's deeply moved. And I find that very helpful when people ask you, why does God allow suffering? And we can clearly see that suffering and death, they deeply move God, the Son. They, they grieve God himself. That is good to know, isn't it? It's really good to know. God the Son shows us this. He, he shows this by experiencing this on earth. It's a good start to an answer, isn't it? It's a hard question and we can't answer the full question, but a good starting point. God grieves too. But there's more to it than that, actually. Deeply moved is a word that comes from the word strength, actually, which is like the word bellowing with strength. It's actually connected to the, 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 the phrase, the word for a horse snorting. It is powerful. It is gut-wrenching. It is indignation. It is almost anger. That is how moved Jesus is. That is helpful, isn't it? Jesus, he sees a world broken by death and he sees red. It is like anger. That is the intensity of his love. He sees our suffering and he sees how hopeless it is and he sees what's behind it. He sees how actually each of us has turned away from God and we've preferred our own darkness to God's light and he, he sees God's response to our rejection of God, which is, as he promised, death would come into our world and be faced by all of us. And it is. And it grieves him. He hates it. And actually what it does is it gives the devil every right to condemn us and accuse us and say they deserve death. And Jesus, he snorts at it like a powerful horse. He is incredulous. He is indignant. He is enraged by this hopeless state that we're in and how we're powerless to escape it and the devil's power over us. And he's cross. And the mourners wail and the tears flow and it is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Jesus thinks it's wrong. John Calvin, very helpful about this, I think. Christ does not come to the sepulchre, that's the tomb, as an idle spectator, but like a wrestler preparing for the contest. Therefore, no wonder he groans again, for the violent tyranny of death, which he had to overcome, stands before his eyes. Jesus, he's indignant at what he sees. And so Jesus says, move the stone away. And you can imagine the gasps, move the stone away. And Martha tries to argue with him, but Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? What Jesus is about to do is going to show God for who he is so that we can trust him. And so they take the stone away. And yes, you're meant to think about Jesus's tomb, aren't you, later? And the stone being taken away. It's a foreshadow of what's going to happen. And then Jesus prays and he prays to his father and he says, it's not for my sake, it's, it's for their sake, verse 42, so that they might believe. And verse 43, when he'd said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. Just in case you've forgotten he was dead. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. So it's not as amazing as Jesus' resurrection, is it? When the grave clothes are kind of neatly to one side and that's no problem. But no, Lazarus, he must kind of like bunny hop out of the tomb or something like that he is raised but it's kind of like a temporary raising isn't it in a broken world still he's still going to die but it is pretty amazing and it is a, it is a taste Jesus will call you by name out of death 
if you trust in him. Isn't that great? He'll call your name. He'll call you out of death. That is brilliant. In fact, it's been noted that if Jesus hadn't specified Lazarus' name, all the dead would have come out. That would have been a bit awkward, wouldn't it, really? Um, but he did. He said Lazarus. So it's okay, just Lazarus came. But what a, what a wonderful hope for all of us. We so want God's help, don't we? We want God's answer to prayer. We question if God loves us or if God cares when we don't see his answer to prayer. And here is our answer. Look at Jesus and see who God is. See him for who he is. God comes into our dark world and he is enraged by what it's become and he will not have it. He is like, forgive me, he is like Neo in the Matrix saying, no, I am not letting this win. Come out. God cares about our broken world. He wants to fix our broken world and he will. That is God's glory. That is his love. That is how you see him and you see him in Jesus. Does he care? Yes. Does he care about the other things that trouble us? Does he just care about death? Is that all he cares about? No, he cares about all those things. We can know he cares about all those things because he cares about the ultimate symptom of all of those things, the ultimate symptom of our broken world, which is death. And so we can know him for who he is, even as we wait in the broken world now, Yes, we have life after death, but we have life now as we wait for this final hope. Did you notice this? I've been really encouraged by this. Do you see this? Jesus says, and whoever lives, present tense, whoever lives now by believing in me will never die. Isn't that great? By believing in Jesus, we really live now. We are in relationship with God right now, forgiven. We are friends with God. We are close to God in a closeness that will never be taken away even when we die. We know God, even as we groan and we cry out in a broken world. And so the morning after Peter died, a few hours later, I preached the verse that I'd read to him in hospital the day before, and Peter had smiled at this verse. It's the last response I got from Peter. It was in 2 Timothy, actually. And it says, the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life that's in Christ Jesus. For all those in Jesus by faith. It's a promise. Peter had hope for the future, but he knew God now in his suffering. And he smiled. I wonder... Do you have that hope yourself? Don't face death without Jesus, but don't face life now without Jesus either. And if you need any more encouragement that he really is loving, very briefly, let me give you point three. Jesus loves and dies. This is a real way you see, you see God, isn't it? Verse 53. Amazing. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Look at that. Jesus knew this would happen, didn't he? He knew by going to Judea, he risked his life. The disciples actually warn him that he's going to risk his life doing this, and they were right. And we are told it was Passover time as well, which is when the lambs die we remember the lambs dying in place of the israelites remember we saw that and the blood put around the door frames of the israelites and the high priest he says far more than he knows when he says that jesus should die for the nations and those in other nations jesus he's absolutely right is the passover lamb who died in our place he, his blood is what rescues us. He gives resurrection life. Yes, he does. But by taking our forever death on the cross and rising again. Is that not love? 
Is that not God's glory? Do you not see God in Jesus? And so Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Jesus wants us to believe this. Father, thank you so much. Jesus wants us to have this hope of life, life after death and life now. Father, thank you that we see in Jesus your glory. We see, we see that you care about our broken world. We see that it it enrages you, that it grieves you, that you feel it deeply. We see that you want to fix it and you will. And we know you for who you are. Father, it is so hard sometimes waiting in this world for it to be fixed. It is so hard when we feel delays to our prayers being answered. Father, help us to keep going, knowing you for who you are in Jesus and really living by faith in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.